Okay, we're going to get started. First, let me uh, welcome those who have not yet participated in any event at Energy Week to our second annual Energy Week. It's going great so far. We had a wonderful day yesterday, and today has been terrific as well. I want to thank our sponsors. Their names have been scrolling on the screen. I hope you've noticed. I'm going to mention their names, though, because we are very grateful. We want you to be aware of who's uh, made this possible. Automated Logic, a United Technologies company, Duquesne Light Company, Southern Company, ITRON, NGH Energy, NRG, Philips, and WGL Energy. Please join me in thanking our sponsors. And because we can't thank the judges too many times, I'm going to thank you yet again, and I'll do it even another time for sure. Um, for everybody else, I want you to know that they've spent the afternoon judging the 14 teams that entered the competition this year to choose the final four. And we're going to have the tip-off right now. Uh, it's going to work like this, teams. You get 10 minutes, and just as she did in your 30-second pitches before the afternoon started, Debbie will time you, and at the 10 minute mark, she'll say stop, and you gotta stop. Uh, that'll be it. The judges will be evaluating you in the same way they did in the afternoon, and uh, submitting their evaluations of you. Um, we will tally the forms and be announcing uh, the winner, winners, uh, at approximately 5.30, uh, sorry, no, about 6.30. With, with uh, no further ado, we have four finalists, two from Carnegie Mellon, and two from the University of Maryland. Yay. So we've got a real uh, Tartans Terrapins face-off here. Uh, so next up is uh, MPEL EV Tech from the University of Maryland. Uh, my name is Michael D'Antonio, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Power Electronics Laboratory Electric Vehicle Team. Uh, I'm here today to present an integrated onboard charger for electric vehicles that's a market-driven solution to promote sustainable transportation with the future capability for smart energy distribution. I invite you to... Okay. How do we go next? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, there goes. Um, okay, so I invite you to meet our team of highly experienced electrical engineers, all pursuing PhD degrees at the University of Maryland in College Park. While each of us has contributed something unique to the project, we're collectively passionate about sustainability in electric vehicle development and the future impact that the growing technology possesses. And obviously we've identified our need for a bit more business-focused leadership uh, for right now, we've filled this void uh, with the help of two fantastic mentors, including Akbar Dawood and Lindsay D'Ambrosio, who have excelled at startup level businesses and offered valuable experience thus far and connections moving forward. Here's a brief background. Electric vehicle sales constitute one of the fastest growing markets in the world. Uh, last year, global EV sales were around 770,000, and this was about 1% of total uh, global auto sales. Reachers has shown that there is a 59% year-over-year growth in the electric vehicle market as well in the future. While the U.S. makes up one of the growing, uh, makes up a large growing market for electric vehicles, China and Western Europe top total sales, which establishes electric vehicles as a truly global market. Uh, data shows that electric vehicles will have a 3% market penetration by 2020, which is the equivalent of about 3 million uh, new electric vehicles in that year. Furthermore, we expect a 15% market penetration in 2020, which means about 17 million new vehicles in 2025 alone. So as we can see from the figure, we're looking at the blue line, the S-curve. Uh, the number and percent of electric vehicles is growing at a pretty impressive rate. So the question might be, why get into this market now? Well, the numbers speak for themselves. We're, con we're confident that our product will see market exposure within the next two years. If we can establish our place in this industry by 2020, we can expect an absolute boom in sales and growth from 2020 to 2030 when it's expected that electric vehicles become cheaper than the alternatives. 
So in terms of EV technology, optimization of component size, weight, and efficiency uh, is, is essential. And while major improvements and research are being conducted to deliver a more affordable baseline electric vehicle price, the primary research driving this cost down is the cost of the vehicle's battery. Component cost is often overlooked and could work to supplement reduced battery cost. Our integrated onboard charger is a product that could make uh, uh, improvements into all of the categories listed above. Furthermore, our research project is funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. So as we can see from the figure below, this is the current existing technology. It's a dual charging solution with an onboard charger to power the high voltage propulsion battery and an additional auxiliary charger for the low voltage battery, which powers auxiliary technologies in the vehicle like the radio, lights, etc. Our solution is a combination of the two into one. <clears throat> um, and the technical comparison can be seen in the following slide. It's not going again. Oh, here we go. OK. So uh, in this image, we see a more technical breakdown of exactly what the existing solution looks like. Again, we see the dual charging solution but, and the addition of the communication required between the two independent chargers. On the right, again, we see our solution, a much more compact design. Speaking about the technology itself, um, our, our, uh, our design is a three-port charger using a half-bridge resonant design and integrated transformer. All this means is with our, we're able to achieve high efficiency over our entire operating range. We see that existing solutions have poor light load efficiency. And this is a crucial flaw because around half of the charging cycle is done during the light load operation period. That's because the charging cycle is heavy during the beginning and middle, but it slows down towards the end to protect the overcharging of the battery. And we can define uh, light load as being around 10 to 20, 30% uh, of the total rated power of the charger. In terms of control, I was, as I mentioned, we have the mitigation of the required communications between chargers. With size and weight, we reduce two large bulky chargers into a single efficient high power density device. In cost, we uh, replace two products with a single one. And finally, in power direction, this is our novel achievement in this product, bidirectionality. Bidirectionality is the ability to charge and use the high voltage battery for vehicle propulsion, as well as the included capability to send energy outside of the vehicle when you, uh, for some other purpose whenever you need to. So this has serious implications for grid stability and the microgrid ideas. Uh, giving our product a truly future-driven capability that will certainly be commonplace for vehicle technology in the coming years. Uh, this is a prototype of our integrated onboard charger, and we can have a sense of appreciation for the condensed size and organization here. Um, here are the uh, performance metrics for a current Brusa onboard charger, and below is our technology. As we can see, we've designed the voltage and power ratings to be similar. However, I would like to highlight the improvements that we make on the size and performance metrics. We can clearly see reduction in weight and size, improvement of maximum efficiency, and improvement of light load efficiency, as we mentioned, is incredibly crucial in the last section. Furthermore, the price difference speaks for itself. As a summary of the previous slides, uh, we've quantified exactly how much we're uh, improving. So we have a 58% cost improvement, a 2% maximum efficiency improvement, 7% light load efficiency improvement, and a reduction in size and weight by 43% and 30% respectively. Now we also have value propositions for consumers that look like the following. With our component, consumers can see a lower baseline EV cost. They can also see reduced charging time and charging costs because of our improvements in efficiency. Now studies have shown that an 8.5% improvement, improvement in light load efficiency uh, will reduce your EV charging costs by one full month per year. This is 8%, 8.5% above 83% for the current technology. We're at 7% improvement, and we're currently working to get to this 8% mark. Furthermore, we can see a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions because less energy is needed to charge each individual electric vehicle. Now, speaking of our market entrance, we want to operate uh, as, a as a product licensing to OEMs and EV manufacturers. Uh, first, we have a, a company named Genovation Incorporated. This is a small business green electric vehicle manufacturer headquartered outside of Washington, D.C. 
Following the verification and establishment within Genovation, we want to extend our technology to other OEMs and EV manufacturers. And like I said in the beginning, and I'll repeat again, this is truly a global business. Um, there's over 30 companies producing electric vehicles at this time, and most companies are, are, are uh, producing more than one electric vehicle. And this number is only going to go up. And as you can see, some of the companies include some of the ones that you've probably heard before. Uh, in terms of barrier protection, we have a patent pending on our product. And I'd like to, to notice that the patent includes both the integrated, the integrated uh, capability as well as the bidirectionality feature. Now, <clears throat> it's important to note that the, the patent that we have is technically owned by the University of Maryland. However, the company that we will form within our team will have ex has exclusive rights to this patent. In terms of projections, um, we expect that we'll need an original cash infusion of around $250,000 to $300,000 based on the one-year period we expect until we could roll out our product to Genovation. Um, while there's some funding resources uh, included below, um, this money will go primarily to the conclusion of product development, company formation, investor search, and customer discovery, our next big thing. In terms of the financials, the parts involved in our product t uh, cost around $800 now, raw costs. And then we can assume an additional $200 for hidden costs as well. So this puts the total cost per unit at around $1,000. We selected a suggested retail price of $1,500. This is about half of the current, uh, the current price for wholesale Brusa chargers that we mentioned previously. Finally, we selected a license fee of $70 per charger. This is, can be simply seen as a 5% royalty on every product sold. So again, assuming a 3% market penetration in 2020, which is about 3 million new electric vehicles worldwide, if we were in every vehicle in 2020, our market potential is about $210 million, considering this $70 license fee. And that's three years from now. Below, I have some projections. These are realistic projections. In 2020, we expect that we could make about 5 million, and by 2025, we could reach upwards of 100 million. This 5 million in 2020 is 2.5% of the total electric market, electric vehicle market. And this, what this comes down to is technically one or two of the 30 companies producing electric vehicles at this time, a realistic estimate. So, but going back to a summary of our product, electric vehicle market is generating massive traction on a global scale and it has a large growth year over year. The combination of our two charger technology into a single onboard charging unit for electric vehicles is truly unique and leads to efficiency improvements, cost weight size savings, and the bi-directionality feature that's truly a, f a, a future component. Our global licensing strategy to OEMs and EV manufacturers guarantees a high profitability in terms of our financial projections, and we have a patent pending, a patent protected uh, technology to ensure our lifetime. Finally, with the $50,000 cash prize from Allegheny, we would conclude the development of our OBC prototype and do some final testing. We would uh, do our company formation because the funds that we get here are not restricted to solely research and development. And finally, we do a commercialization plan and search for other investments. And I want to leave you guys with one quote, not quote really, but just a sentence. Um, the complete electric vehicle, uh, the complete electrification of vehicles is the future of the world. And advanced charging systems are one of the key enablers to make this a reality. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Please welcome Tara Tonics from Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you. Beep, 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 beep. Have you ever heard this sound from your smoke detector? Beep, 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 beep. Isn't it annoying? <laughs> Hi, my name is Ivan, and I'm happy to tell you about Teratonics. At Teratonics, we develop a revolutionary device to convert ambient radio waste to electricity and provide a maintenance-free replacement for batteries. There are going to be 26 to 50 billion of connected devices by 2020. And there is no way all of them will be powered by wires. It would cost too much to throw additional power line to every single sensor 
beacon or a smoke detector. Batteries work well to some point. They are cheap, well known, and seem to be so easy to replace, which is true if you have one smoke detector or five. But if you have a thousand of them, changing batteries becomes a serious problem. By 2020, one million maintenance workers will be needed globally to change 26 billion batteries. Each of them, 26,000 batteries per year, or 100 per workday. Worth mentioning, in the US, it is considered to be an electrician-type job. And on top of that, in many large entities, CMU included, it is a union shop job. That's why it costs so much. Another huge problem, battery waste. Three billion batteries, or 180,000 tons of hazardous waste, is dispersed per year in the US only. The increase of this number could be really detrimental to the environment. So how do we save the world from turning into a battery landfill? The solution is to generate electricity at the spot. Devices that convert solar, thermal energy, or mechanical motion to electricity called energy harvesters. Unfortunately, sources of ambient energy are not always available. Wind turbines need wind. Solar panels need sun. Thermal electrical generators need high temperature gradient. Radio waves or radio frequency radiation is probably the most convenient source of power, ubiquitously available in a typical urban environment. The energy comes from radio and TV towers, <coughs> Wi-Fi and cell phone transmitters. We users consume only a tiny portion of this energy. 99% is wasted. At Tartonix, we can collect this energy and send it back to work. Hey, what can we do with this power? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm staying here. So uh, by converting, uh, by generating electricity at the spot, we cut lifetime maintenance costs for wireless devices by a factor of 10 when compared to batteries. We eliminate hazardous battery waste. We provide stable, stable performance independent of, of weather conditions. We enable truly ubiquitous uh, IoT prolifer proliferation and placement of sensors in all required locations, which is a critical element of the future uh, industrial development, where multiple sensors will be placed in all possible locations and provide timely and precise information from all production phases. This is probably the most technical slide in my presentation, and it explains why we have the first technology on the market to produce a meaningful amount of energy. Due to the limitations of the state-of-the-art methods, current technologies can target only a very narrow frequency range and collect energy from only one source of energy, Wi-Fi, for example. Another key difference is, at, is that at Tratonix, we can collect very weak radio waves, starting from low microwatts all the way up. Alternative solution can target only the most intensive portion of the signal. So what can we do with the energy that we can collect? Let's consider smoke detectors again. Manufacturers of low power devices claim that their devices can run on a battery change, on, one, on a single battery change for three to five years. In reality, the discharge rate of every device is determined by many factors location, temperature regime, operation regime. For example, smoke detector that is installed by the outside entrance overall works in a cold environment. The battery discharge at a faster rate. It needs to be changed more frequently. And in large entities, it is close to impossible to keep track of battery changes here and there. So what happens is that maintenance workers change all of them at once, usually once per year. Powered by Teratonix, sensors will run for a lifetime. Teratonix Energy Harvester is a passive device. There is no moving parts or anything like that. There is, there is nothing to break. It can last even longer than, than the powered device. And this is where all of these devices will be used. This is how the future factory will look like. It will be full of smart wireless devices, sensors, smart meters, active RFIDs, beacons, and of course, smoke detectors. The Teratonix Energy Harvester can power up most of these devices. 
According to BCC research, over 88 million of RF energy harvesters will be installed by 2020. The absence of the alternative equal efficient technologies allow us to seize 30% of this market. Our direct customers are low power device manufacturers and there is such a need on the market for maintenance free solutions that their customers and IoT users are willing to pay double price for maintenance free solutions according to our research. So we sell uh, battery replacement, IoT manufacturers sell self power devices and users save on maintenance expenses. And the value that we create with our technology is so high that there is enough margin for all of the stage, stages of this food chain. At the later stage of the development, we will license our technology out to large electronic companies' manufacturers. And the economies of scale they will be able to achieve will drive the price for the device down and allow truly ubiquitous technology proliferation. Our uh, the effectiveness of our technology is attributed to proprietary ultra-high speed die developed in CMU. That's on the first slide. Small thin and uh, microscopic increase on, on the top. And that's, uh, that's a small thing on, on our testing bed that we use now. I guess it is, far, it is too far to see for you, but someone have, have seen it, and I can show you in more details. So this is our testing bed, and this is what we are working now. Instead of our direct input we use now, we will have the antenna that will collect the whatever energy is in the air, and LED as a output that will blink every time enough energy is collected. In two months we'll, or so, we will have this technology working, and it will be really cool to see how it works with no intentional energy applied. Almost the magic. After the prototype demonstration, we will be ready to raise our first round of capital to develop a scalable manufacturing technology for our diets and energy harvesters. As a result of this stage, we will have a manufacturable device that will require only working capital to produce. And this is our team. Dr. E. Law, the inventor of the diets, has over two decades of experience in nanoscale semiconductors. Ivan Pistsov, uh, 12 years of entrepreneurial experience, including four years running industrial automation company. And our advisor, Dr. Rui Carly, a world-known expert in, nano, uh, in design of analog circuits. And again, at Teratonics, we develop a revolutionary device to convert ambient radio waves to electricity and provide a maintenance-free replacement for batteries. Thank you. Please welcome Robotny from Carnegie Mellon University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Austin Webb, CEO and co-founder of Robotny. We're an indoor vertical farming company that's using automated robotics and software analytics to transform modern agriculture. So at a high level, I'll certainly get into these details, uh, but we've created an integrated solution of hardware robotics and software robotics that allow us to have a superior operational workflow and therefore margins against other vertical farms. Uh, we have a baseline of 180 times yields per 2D square foot compared to outdoor agriculture with the crops we're currently growing. And this means two things for all of us in this room. One, we can be incredibly environmentally sustainable, 95% uh, less water, uh, no topsoil degradation, no runoff pollution. And also this means that we can have pure enclosed environments that are human free, where we can optimize for nutrients and taste, and we can have fresh, local, beyond organic produce that's chemical free always, and we can get that year round. Right, and so big reason why we're doing this at Robotny is because traditional ag is unsustainable and the process is, is really truly broken. So in 2050, we're estimated to have 10 billion people on this earth and 80% of the folks will live uh, in urban cities. Um, and so there's huge stress on the supply chain today, short shortages coming from um, supply issues from weather, uh, and then just the fact that there are a lot of issues when it comes to runoff pollution. Uh, traditional ag is the number one pollutant of air and the second, uh, or excuse me, the number one pollutant of water and the second pollutant of air on this, uh, on this planet. Uh, and so vertical farming is a great solution to that, where you can have superior yields, uh, you can grow indoors, you can 
Um, again, avoid the environmental issues, um, and it's certainly got a lot of press over the last, uh, the last couple of years. But what this press isn't really hitting on is the problem that these current vertical farms uh, face, which is that they're extremely inefficient. Grabbing plant trays, using ladders and scissor lifts, doing it uh, by hand, labor costs are just as much as energy costs for these farms. They also waste over half their production space. They use uh, pen and paper uh, and the naked eye instead of computer vision and automated uh, data analytics you know, integrated with the, uh, with the solution. And so obviously at Robotney, we saw this and felt uh, vertical farming has the, the opportunity to change the future. Um, and it's really just not able to do it right now. So we have, again, hardware robotics and software robotics. On the robotic side, uh, we um, have an aut autonomous storage and retrieval system that essentially allows us to bring plants to the workers or to automated stations. This means we have increased labor efficiencies, increased crop output for the same amount of space, and it's fully integrated with our software system and machine learning. So, you know, it's, this, it's a central system of our technology. Uh, we're able to monitor the farm at all times, 24-7, 365, every aspect of the environment. But more importantly, again, we can take all of these and we can optimize for every plant that we grow. We can have the optimal grow recipe based on things as, such as nutrients and taste. And so with that, I'll show a video of our version one miniature farm. Um, I wish I could show you our version two farm, but just for right now, in terms of uh, where we're at patent pending, uh, it's best that we not. So first is a rendering, and then you'll see the real thing. This is over in CMU's incubator, just uh, a couple blocks away. Um, so we would never move the trays around in such a, a crazy fashion, but it certainly shows you what we're able to do. Um, and you can imagine a track system coming out the bottom. That's how our process works. And again, uh, you know, sort of not showing that at this time. Um, in the basement, right, we have automated nutrient mixing, uh, automatically adjusts and, and, and uh, fixes pH if it senses that it's too high or too low. Same with any other environmental uh, impact. Um, we grow leafy greens and herbs currently. Um, we do all of that uh, about two times or three times faster in some cases than uh, you know, growing it in the ground. Um, all red and blue spectrum to date, we're certainly mixing in a lot of uh, white spectrum and green spectrum as well at different, uh, different areas. We're aeroponics, so that's a nutrient-rich spray to the roots, so we are soilless. Um, and again, just using the robotics to not only be efficient in terms of operations, but then move trays to different areas so that they can have different environmental uh, inputs throughout the, you know, throughout the course of their life. Um, and so, you know, with that, moving on, this means a lot of things. One, we can be very efficient, right? We can have high quality produce and produce it very cheaply. Uh, it also means that if you, if you look at other um, competitors in the industry, whether they're farm operators or tech suppliers, we're the only one that's come in and started from scratch and done a complete workflow, uh, reworking of the, uh, of the workflow and doing data and analytics and automation at the same time. Um, and this means that we can do 180 times yields per 2D square foot. Uh, compared to traditional farms and a lot more than other vertical farms and greenhouses that are basically in between vertical farms and outdoor farms. Uh, and so if I haven't you know, made it clear, we are using this technology to be a farm operator. Uh, we're doing that for a lot of reasons. The installed base is limited currently uh, and they just don't have the ability to change. On top of that, we have a lot of opportunities to be very profitable in leveraging our own technology. And again, we've created the playbook. So at the moment, there's no reason to give that away. Uh, but certainly it also allows us to create a market and get to scale quicker um, as we do that. Uh, another reason, right, is that uh, $25 billion total addressable market right now with the, with the crops we're currently growing. And our process uh, is not just pure for produce, but also it makes a pharmaceutical grade process. So medicinal plants is definitely an opportunity. But it really isn't just the size of the market uh, that's important, it's the trends. At every level and every generation, it's all about fresh, local, healthy food. And that is, drive, that is a huge driver um, that's impacting the future. And Robotney is able to fulfill, fulfill all of that. Uh, from a financials perspective, we're able to make 70% gross margins with our technology, 60% EBITDA margins. We have a little bit less than a two-year payback period on a 20,000 square foot farm. And we can cookie cut our model, that first farm, and basically put these throughout North America and then the globe, and obviously scale in that fashion. And so how we do that is launch the first farm here in Pittsburgh, um, leveraging our current channels. We're currently selling to Whole Foods, and I'll get to more of that in a minute. And then look to put up 20 farms by 2022, uh, and then use the fact that we've got a standardized tray to continue automating and innovating throughout the rest of the process, uh, of which majority of is already automated for us. Um, so currently, to date, we've raised $600,000 in venture capital. Um, we've uh, built that version one that you saw. We're building our version two prototype right now. Uh, we're in the process of raising $10 million of a Series A, some of which uh, we expect to come from debt financing considering how well we cash flow, uh, so that we can launch that first farm of 20,000 square feet. Um, and in that same facility, um, we are putting up our version two. That version two is going to do about 40 pounds a day and is going to uh, extend our distribution. Uh, and on top of that, it allows us uh, to, to 
you know, prep for the first farm and expand our marking efforts. We're over in the south side of Pittsburgh in a former steel mill, so it's really exciting to take that and recreate that space uh, as part of the tech transformation. Uh, and so in terms of, you know, you're thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to sell produce called Robotney. That sounds dumb. Well, it's because we're not. Um, you know, our brand is called Pure Sky Farms and we're in Whole Foods. Uh, and we have multiple distribution partners, other grocers and distributors that uh, have verbally committed to uh, taking on our produce once we're able to get to more volume. Um, and so uh, it's really exciting how well our launch has gone there. Uh, together, our team, there's four of us, we have the business, the robotics, the operations, and the software experience uh, to make this happen. Um, and we actually all have growing backgrounds uh, and knowledge, um, so certainly the quality of our produce, I think, can be validated um, by Whole Foods. And so with that, I'd just like to thank you all for your time. Uh, vertical farming is the future, and Robotany is the future of farming. Thank you. Please welcome Reem Power from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to share this dream with me. This has been a dream of mine uh, for most of my adult life. So Reem Power is a renewable energy, uh, is a social enterprise focused on providing access to affordable, clean and reliable energy in developing countries. So I'm going to start with, uh, by sharing a, a couple of stories with you, and I'll encourage you to kind of find your theme along, uh, along the lines of the stories. So first, um, can you imagine being uh, in your doctor's office, uh, getting a minor surgery, and then the light goes off, right? Or like me, uh, who likes to study at night and work at night, growing up in Nigeria, where I about to uh, study with candlelight or kerosene lamps before we could even afford generators or rechargeable lamps. And even if you have rechargeable lamps, you couldn't get uh, power to charge them. Or this is a uh, photo of a barber shop. Uh, this, uh, uh, this photo reminds me uh, of a story. Uh, my niece once asked me, Uncle, why do you always like going bald? You should get a mohawk. And I'm like, you know, uh, I, always, I, always had, uh, I, I once had a mohawk even before mohawks were cool. She's like, how? It's like, you know, when I was growing up in Nigeria, I would go to a barber shop, and right in the middle of your haircut, true story, the power goes off. So half of my hair is gone, and the half is still there. And sometimes we have to walk home like that when, because the power doesn't come on. So electricity, right? Lack, lack of electricity. That's the issue here. So there are 1.3 billion people in the world without access to power or electricity. Uh, one, uh, 600 million of those are in sub-Saharan Africa, and one in six of those, that's 100 million in Nigeria, including small business owners. So how bad is the problem? Nigeria essentially runs on on generators. Uh, a recent report by, with the Federal Minister of Power in Nigeria and the German uh, Economic uh, Development Corporation found out that 86% of Nigerian firms run self-generators, diesel generators to power their businesses. And 48% of the total power in the entire country is self-generation from generators. Even the federal government of Nigeria spent an equivalent of 27 million this year will be spending uh, on generators. Manufacturers, 11, 11 uh, billion dollars. Telecom companies, all the cell towers, you call, I call my mom, I get drop calls like every single time. It's gener they're powered by generators. So, so what's the solution? I re-empower, I believe the solution is renewable energy, right? We're providing access to affordable, low-cost renewable energy to the small business owners. Right now, we're focusing on solar solutions for small businesses in Nigeria, and we hope to be able to grow to other parts of Africa, uh, Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia are, are those on our lists, and also to be able to expand and build capacities in other forms of renewable energy, wind, microhydro, biomass, and geothermal. So again, we're focusing on customers in energy critical and energy intensive industries that actually use a lot of, or run a lot of operations using uh, generators. So these are healthcare, man agriculture, manufacturing, education, information technology, and hospitality. So it's important to note here that this company has already spent billions of dollars, billions of dollars running generators. So the benefit to them is we're, we're going to be able to reduce their costs. So they have higher margin, uh, higher margin leads to growth, and also renewable energy systems are more reliable and resilient than the current sources, uh, diesel generators or petrol generators that they currently use. So how big is the market? What's the market potential here? Uh, a recent McKinsey report estimated that for Sub-Saharan Africa to reach 70% electrification rate, all the countries will need to spend 
$490 billion. And Nigeria being the most populous of those countries, we need to spend $50 billion. And we're targeting 20, uh, about 40% of that market, worth about 20 billion. One of our market strategy, good market strategy is to partner with small business groups. We actually have our small business group that we're working with in Southwest Nigeria in Lagos that has about 1,000 members. We're talking to another group that's actually national that has uh, uh, about 5,000 more small business members that are really interested in actually partnering with us to get the members access to renewable energy solutions. So uh, in Nigeria, for example, how many businesses are we talking about? The National B Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria estimates there are 37 million businesses, uh, small, micro, and medium businesses in the country, and about, we need to serve about uh, 15 million of those to be for make 40%. So how do we make money? So our value proposition to this business is, is that they're already spending the, the life cycle cost of generators uh, to solar is really is about twice the, the amount. So they're already spending a whole lot, 40, according to a World Bank survey, they're spending 40 to 60% of the operation cost just goes only to the fueling operation and maintenance of generators, 60% of, of their operation cost. So the value prop is to, that we're gonna offer a low cost alternative, alternative to that. Uh, we're gonna partner with small businesses, again, like I said before, uh, and then what, we're gonna, what we do, Repower, we install the systems and the customers will pay uh, three options. A, kilowatt per, um, a fee per kilowatt hour, uh, per kilowatt hour uh, is one, one way, and then also another fee per a fixed prepay uh, monthly payment. Also for businesses that have access to uh, financing from ba local banks could actually pay for this and finance it through the local banks. So what's the risk here? So I've, I've got a question. Uh, one, we're partnering with a metering company uh, that we're talking to right now that provides a smart meter, which allows that if customers don't prepay their agreed upon amount, the system locks so they don't have power. Essentially, right now, what they do is if they don't uh, put diesel into the generators, they don't have power. So, and I believe businesses have incentives to want to continue operating, so they're going to want to pay. So uh, the competitive landscape in Nigeria, the renewable energy industry and solar PV in particular is very, is still relatively young and highly fragmented. There are numerous installers in the market, but from my research, we're able to identify a few of these that are serving our target market. Uh, and we also, one thing that our research kind of showed us that was very uh, incitive, incis, inci, um, incitive for us was that uh, quality, there are two, two reasons why the adoption of solar is really low in, in Nigeria right now. The quality of the products and the components used and the reliability of the system installed. So we've ranked and we believe that these two will be our competitive, one of our competitive uh, advantages. So here's an example of um, systems being installed right now. This is unsafe and could be, get blown away by the wind. Here's another in a business building. This is really very dangerous. Here's another. And this is an example of a project that I've done here in the US uh, while I was uh, while working for Solicity. This is something that we would do. This is how you install the ground mount. So advantage, apart from the competitiveness, uh, competitive advantage that we have in terms of quality and reliability, uh, my experience, I worked four years for SolarCity, uh, the number one US installer. I was born and raised in Nigeria, so I have uh, a lot of connections there. I have a lot of people in government who have been involved in the transition and privatization of the current uh, of, uh, um, power infrastructure. So there's a network that I can tap into there in terms of policies. Also, this has been a vision and passion of mine, and even one of the reasons why I came to the US to study was identifying the, power, the issue of power problems in, in Nigeria and other African countries, and hoping that I came here to study, and then I hoped I was planning to go back and actually be able to do this and fix the problems. So our milestones to date, uh, we have a registered limited liability in the country. Again, we have a small business group in Lagos that we're working with. We're in talks with another national group. Uh, we've secured uh, a partnership with the U.S. Uh, a supplier, which is going to give us, uh, you know, top quality systems that are going to actually be reliable and, and, and we will have a long period of time. Uh, also, uh, we're working with a training institution for labor training and technical know-how. This is our team. Uh, like I said, uh, we've got four years working for Solar City. Jeff uh, has four years as an aeronautic engineer, works for the uh, US Air Force. He also just installed solar in his home, has been working with a nonprofit installing solar in, DC, in the DC area. And we have a contact person on ground who has also been uh, an engineering professor and has been done some business consulting. So we're, right now we're trying to pilot uh, our, our model and, uh, and uh, a business model. So we'll, uh, we're partnering with a small business group to select 10 businesses in Lagos to be able to pilot this with. So we need, uh, we're asking for $50,000 to be able to do this. This will go into the equipment purchase, panels, inverters, batteries, 
um, and also the labor and all the other costs associated. The most important part of this is this is going to, when this succeeds, it's going to help us scale. We're in conversations right now with local banks in Nigeria, and they're looking for a proof of concept. And when this succeeds, we'll be able to scale faster. Here's the use of funds. And the big part for, for me is, for this is, Rempower is not just any other solar company. It's a solar company with three pillars, people, planning, and profit. The people part of this is really important to me. And this is a recent uh, uh, um, banner from a protest in Nigeria recently after the elections. And this is what drives me. The goal of Rempower is to be able to provide electricity to revive industries that provide job and serves as the catalyst for socioeconomic development. Thank you very much. Okay, so the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, our um, human calculator has been busily tallying the votes uh, under strict security. We were going to use Price Waterhouse, but ever since a little incident in Hollywood, we decided to dispense with them and use our own DS LLC. That's for Deborah Stein uh, LLC. Um, so, we're, we're awarding uh, five prizes. The fan favorite in first, second, and two third place uh, among our final four. Our fan favorite, and they get $5,000 in this handsome trophy, is uh, Minimus from Robert Morris University. Come on up. You got to bear with us. Is a lot of this is about the photograph, you know, and all of that. So, you know what? Say your name, each of you, please. My name is Dale Miller. And what's your major? I'm a communications advertising major. What year? I'm a senior. Senior. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Funderlich. Uh, this is a little hard to believe, but I'm an accounting and finance major at Robert Morris University, and I'm a junior. She was the presenter. Terrific job. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Fauzan Wasil. Uh, I'm a Master of Sustainable Design in School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. Oh, from Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. okay. Mary, you get the trophy. Oh, thank you so Come much. Here. Okay, our first third place winner is Reem Power from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much. So we heard your name before, but say it again and tell us where you're from and what year you're in. Uh, Baba Femi, I debutize my name. I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm a second year MBA student. Where, where are you from originally? Uh, Nigeria. You're from Nigeria. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And our second third place winner is MPEL EV from University of Maryland. So, so you're all alone? You don't have any of your teammates with you? Uh, yeah, I'm all alone today. We actually found out uh, uh, yesterday at 6 o'clock that we were accepted into the finals today. So ah. we made a last-minute decision, got down here early this morning, and uh, really thankful to bring home this third-place prize. Thank and you to everybody here. Okay, our second place team of uh, winners of $10,000 is Teratonix from Carnegie Mellon. All right, I 
you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you at school and where are you from? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm a second year MBA at Tepper. And I want to introduce Rohit Clark, a member of the team who helped a lot on the technical side. Oh, you. Hi, I'm Rohit. I'm a graduate student at the Energy Science, Technology, and Policy program at CMU. And I've been assisting Ivan a bit uh, throughout the competition. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So you probably figured out who gets the first place prize. I'm sure the Robotny team has figured it out. Come on up, Robotny from Carnegie Mellon. Congratulations. Congratulations. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, yes, again, my name is Austin Webb, uh, second year MBA uh, at the Tepper School of Business here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, originally from North Carolina, a former investment banker. Not sure how I became modern farmer, but thank you all. Appreciate it. You get the check.